Hi, I'm Dr. Margie Nichols. I'm a psychologist and a sex therapist, and I'm also the director of the Institute for Personal Growth in New Jersey. Um, we're a, a psychotherapy organization that has done queer affirmative therapy since 1983. I've also lived and worked in the LGBT community for over 30 years. I write, I lecture, I talk on a lot of queer topics. But today what I'm going to talk to you about is the forgotten B in LGBT, bisexuality. I'm going to start with some definitions and as we go along I think you're going to find that um, defining bisexuality is one of actually one of the most difficult things to do. But let's start with some ways that other people have defined bisexuality. The bisexual activist Robin Oakes writes, I call myself bisexual because I acknowledge that I have in myself the potential to be attracted, romantically and or sexually, to people of more than one sex and or gender, not necessarily at the same time, not necessarily in the same way, and not necessarily to the same degree. The San Francisco Human Rights Commission in 2011 did a major study of bisexuality, uh, which we'll refer to later in this, and they wrote, bisexuality is the capacity for emotional, romantic, and or physical attraction to more than one sex or gender. A bisexual, a bisexual orientation speaks to the potential for, but not the requirement of, involvement with more than one sex or gender. So, so think about it for a minute. What are these definitions saying? Um, they're talking about the capacity to be attracted. They're not talking about behavior. They're not talking about identity. They're talking about the capacity to be attracted, sexual attraction, romantic attraction, both to more than one gender. But it, the attraction doesn't have to be equal. You don't have to act on it, and you don't have to be attracted to both genders at the same time. So if you think about it, that covers a huge spectrum of people. Um, and you're going to see that, that bisexuality becomes kind of a residual category where, well, not gay, not straight, throw them in the bisexual bucket. Um, and that means that there's a lot of different types of people who define themselves as bisexual or who have bisexual attractions and don't define themselves as bisexual. So I've been talking about attractions, behavior, identity, let's, let's get, uh, I'm going to give you some definitions of those as well. Attraction is what you feel inside, right? Usually when we talk about attraction we're talking about sexual attraction, but for some people sexual and romantic attraction are not separated. But let's leave it at the sort of most basic sexual attraction to more than one gender, and I'm saying that deliberately instead of saying male or female because as we're going to discuss later on, there, you know, we've embraced the concept of a gender spectrum um, and we're going to need to embrace the, the concept of a sexual orientation spectrum as well. Um, so attraction is just your feeling of attraction to people. Behavior, obviously, having sex. Um, you don't have, and identity means you're owning that behavior as signifying what your identity is. So people don't have much control over who they're attracted to, but they do have control over their behavior and they certainly have control over whether they acknowledge what they're doing to themselves, you know, inside to themselves privately and or acknowledge it privately, uh, publicly to other people. So here's another principle that I think is important for you to keep in mind. Um, Any time a given identity is stigmatized in a given culture, like ours stigmatizes same-sex attraction, you're going to find that there are more people who are attracted to the same sex, let's say, and in our case we're talking about bisexuality, you're going to find that there are more people who are attracted to both sexes than there are people who act on that attraction, and you're also going to find that there are more people who act on the attraction than people who claim the identity as their own. Which also means, if you think about it, that self-proclaimed identity is maybe one of the worst ways to define bisexuality.
So how does this principle that in a culture that stigmatizes um, a given sexual orientation, you have a lot of people who are essentially hiding their attractions and their behavior, how does that affect bisexuality? Well, in 2013, um, there was a Pew study about bisexuality that showed that bisexuals are stigmatized not just by the straight community, but also by the gay and lesbian community. And they found, the Pew study found that only 28% of bisexuals were out to important people in their lives. We're not talking about publicly here. We're just talking about people telling those closest to them. Only 28% of bisexuals are out to important people in their lives as compared to 71% of lesbians and 77% of gay men. That's pretty phenomenal, okay? So that means that any research that relies on identifying yourself as bisexual is going to totally represent people with a bisexual attraction or bisexual behavior. So because bisexual people experience pressure from both the heterosexual world and from the gay community, their inclination is to, a bisexual's inclination is to identify either as straight or as gay depending on the gender of their current partner. Now think about it for a minute. Nobody, no human being wants to be totally isolated and alone. I mean, I suppose there are some, a few people who do, we call them hermits, but people were, we're wired to live in communities. We're wired to need not only family support, but we're wired to need to feel we belong to a tribe. Okay, so there's the straight tribe and there's the gay tribe, and bisexuals don't belong either place and they're sort of hanging out there in the middle with no one to advocate and support for them. So it's understandable given that. Um, it's understandable why somebody who's got bisexual attraction would hide it and would identify either as lesbian or gay or as straight. Um, so a, another reason for you to keep in mind that somebody's self-proclaimed identity doesn't mean that much. I'll give you a reason in the, uh, 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 an example in the opposite direction. Um, nearly a hundred percent of lesbians have had sex with men. Does that mean that all lesbians are bisexual and attracted to men? No. As we well know, it is possible to perform the sex act, especially for a woman, without being turned on. So, the, the all, when you're looking at sexual orientation and sexual orientation behavior, you really have to take all factors into account. Attraction, behavior, and identity. So given all that, what are the statistics about and the figures about how many people are bisexuality? First of all, not too many st research studies even bother to ask the question. They, you know, most research studies don't think that they'll get enough bisexual people to study them as a group and so everybody gets lumped into the gay or the straight camp in, in most research that's not on sexual orientation. The few studies that have bothered to ask questions about bisexuality, most of them, even given the low percentage of bisexuals that tell other people that they're, that, about their orientation, even given that, most people currently self-identify as bisexual that identify as gay or lesbian. And the younger you get, the more that true that is. Um, in the most recent, one of the most recent surveys in 2010 um, in the Journal of Sexual Medicine found that 3.1% of their population sample identified as bisexual and only 2.5% as gay or lesbian. And as I said, younger, more than older, it's the trend of the future. There's some evidence for us to, that leads us to believe that um, younger, especially younger women are um, behaviorally bisexual more than ever before. Which leads me to another point about um, bisexuality in populations. There's an ongoing argument about whether women um, identify more than men. I mean, they do identify more than men. There's an ongoing debate about whether that reflects something real about their sexuality or just the fact that women are more likely to take that risk and self-identify as bisexual. We don't know. 
Um, there's an ongoing debate about whether men, women are more bisexual than men. We'll discuss that, you know, down the road here in this course. So, you can see by now, I hope, that just because you label yourself or someone else labels you as bisexual, as a group, bisexuals don't necessarily have that much in common. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some examples. To illustrate that a little further, I'm going to give you some examples of, um, of the different kinds of people that might label themselves bisexual. And in fact, the first couple of researchers that did research on bisexuality in the 1970s, um, Philip Blumstein and Pepper Schwartz, they determined that there was no one, there was no th one bisexual prototype, not, no one bisexual lifestyle. Now that's true for gay and lesbian people as well, but it's even more true of bisexuals. There's much more diversity of lifestyle, of, um, um, of path um, to bisexuality and path to uh, identity than there is with gays or lesbians. But here's some examples of um, people who might label themselves bisexual. The person who is bisexual in their attraction but clearly prefers one gender over another. The person who's sexually attracted to um, uh, both men and women but romantically attracted to only one. The person who feels they need a male and female lover at the same time. The person who practices serial bisexuality for a while they're with women, for a while they're with men. The person who, and I will acknowledge that there are some people like this, the person who's really gay and can't admit to themselves that they're bisexuality. That is the gay stereotype of bisexuals, and we'll talk about that more too. But stereotypes usually have some basis in reality, and um, historically there are people who have really not had a heterosexual bone in their body but identified as bisexual because they couldn't tolerate the gay label. Um, the person that feels that their attractions to males and females are fluid, that at different points in their own history they've been more attracted to one gender than another, versus the person who feels that they've always had kind of a stable bisexual attraction. Um, the person who feels that for them gender is irrelevant, that they really, it's just not something they notice, um, they fall in love with people on the basis of who they are and not their genitals. Or let's say the person who is only attracted to um, a gender um, a presentation irregardless of gender. For example, some people are attracted to butches, whether they're male butches or female butches. And that's sort of how they define themselves as bisexual. The genitals aren't important, but the gender presentation actually is involved. So, are you confused yet? Um, you should be confused. I said a little earlier that bisexuality in some ways is a residual attraction, uh, a, a residual category, and it kind of is because um, the mind boggles at all the combinations and permutations of people who identify as bisexual or who don't, who identify as genderqueer, pansexual, some other identity that incorporates um, sexual attraction to both, to more than one gender, but doesn't use the bisexual label. One upside to the complexity of bisexuality, which I hope you will find as we go along, is that um, we have we can learn a lot about human sexuality and gender in, in general um, from bisexuality. And in fact, some of the most interesting research on sex and gender diversity is now being funded by the American Institute for Bisexuality. Okay, I'm going to end this part of the introduction with a couple of more um, definitions. I want to talk about biphobia, by invisibility, and by erasure. So, gay people, we call the irrational hatred of gay people homophobia. And just in, in just the same way we could call the irrational hatred of bisexuals biphobia. Bisexuality, the, the, the 
the stigma attached to bisexuality, biphobia, is sort of dependent on homophobia, meaning, if you think about it, if if we didn't we if society didn't look down still on um, same sex relationships and same sex behavior to a certain extent, then bisexuality would be no big deal. All right, so there's this dependent aspect of biphobia, but it's more complicated than that. Straight people have an additional reason to hate bisexuals, and that is that if if we can think of everybody as either gay in the gay camp or straight in the straight camp and there's absolutely no overlap then straight people can feel secure in their sexuality no straight person ever has to wonder if they're secretly gay because you know you only have one type of attraction if you're attracted to the opposite sex you're straight if you're attracted to the same sex you're gay so what does bisexuality do? Bisexuality puts in a big gray zone and that makes a lot of heterosexuals uncomfortable and that's really the source. The fact that bisexuality is in that middle range, is in the, um, the kind of gray zone, in between zone of sexual orientation that makes it threatening to heterosexuals. And in fact, um, heterosexual people rank bisexuals next to last on a list of groups that they find in, in whether they find them acceptable or not. So if you give, you know, um, um, Jews, Christians, black people, women, old people, gay people, bisexuals, if you give um, straight people a list of stigmatized social groups that um, they could, and ask them to rank them as to whether they find them acceptable or not. Bisexuality is ranked next to last. The only category of people that ranks lower are people who are injecting drug users like heroin addicts and crack addicts. Um, so that's a pretty fierce, I would say that's a pretty fierce hatred of bisexuals. Gay people, I, 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 I don't know whether there has been extensive research on how, um, how deep the biphobia is in the gay community, but the source of bi biphobia in the gay community is a little bit different than the source for heterosexuals. Um, remember when I mentioned a little earlier that there are some people who use the bisexual label in order to avoid um, acknowledging that they're gay? Gay people sort of know instinctively that that's true, at least in some cases. Um, and so there is this sense that bi a bisexual person is going to betray you. They're never going to stay with you. They're never going to give up um, heterosexual privilege. They're always going to ultimately wind up in a heterosexual relationship. Um, and a sense, because it's believed that, that bisexuals really can't cope with the stigma of being gay, that's why they use that label in the first place, um, and that in a pinch, they're going to run, you're going to be left alone. And they also believe, and again, there is some truth to this, that um, people who have bisexual sexual contact are a vector of um, sexually transmitted disease into the gay community or into the, especially during the AIDS epidemic, that was a large source of, of um, biphobia among both heterosexuals and um, lesbians. Okay, so lesbians were afraid that bisexual women would bring AIDS into the lesbian community. Straight people were afraid that bisexual men would bring AIDS um, into the straight community. So the disease is one factor, but really, it, it, I, want, I want you to understand that the sources of biphobia are somewhat different if it's coming from a gay person, coming from a straight person, because that also relates to sort of how you address that biphobia. Another, the last important thing about biphobia is just as homophobia can be internalized, right, which means internalized homophobia means that um, that you've taken in that social stigma and now you hate yourself, biphobia can be internalized. And so there are many, unfortunately, self-hating bisexual people. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is bi-invisibility.
Um, remember I said that only 28% of bisexual people are out compared to over three quarters of, of lesbians and gay men. Well, and they identify as gay if they're with a same-sex partner and straight if they're with a heterosexual partner. That makes bisexual people invisible. And even when bisexual people don't make themselves invisible, straights and gays um, prefer to ignore that. Um, prefer to ignore... So the, both straight people and gay people will label a bisexual person according to the gender of their partner too. I'm bisexual. I, when I was with a man, um, a frustrating number of people told me that I had gone straight again and saying that I was still attracted to a woman confused everybody. Gay people wanted to sort of claim me as lesbian. That's by invisibility. Um, the San Francisco uh, report on bisexuality said that it was rampant in the gay community um, and they define it as they say, by invisibility refers to a lack of acknowledgement or ignoring of the clear evidence that bisexuals exist. So the final definition I'm going to give you before we end this segment is the concept of bi erasure. And that is in history, right? Because bisexuals have historically been invisible, um, they they are not uh, bise bisexuals in history are not acknowledged any more than than bisexuals who currently exist. Um, for example, I've seen Alexander the Great, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Dusty Springfield claimed as gay by the gay community, straight by the straight community, but the evidence is all three of them were probably bisexual. That's by erasure. So this section is going to be on the history of bisexuality um, and mostly on the history of the concept of bisexuality. So we now know that gay sex is rampant in the animal kingdom. We know from um, uh, evolutionary biologists like Bruce Bagamill, we know from, uh, and Joan Ruffgarden, we know from books like Sex at Dawn, um, we know that bisexuality is as common in our early ancestors and in the an animal kingdom as, um, as, as homosexual behavior. Um, in fact, we actually know more than that. We know that most sexual acts in nature are not about reproduction. That's a fact that kind of shocks people often, but um, because, you know, we're all taught that the primary function of sex is reproduction. But in fact, that's not true. It appears that in most animal, in animals that have social behavior, um, in primates and in humans, early humans, the function of sexual acts was really more for affiliation, for um, establishing connection between different groups for establishing power dominances, um, for comfort, for fun, for play, for all kinds of things other than reproduction. So if that's the case, then why not bisexuality? It makes sense that if sex is for a lot of other functions that uh, other than reproduction, that it doesn't, that it wouldn't narrowly be confined to heterosexual behavior among animals. We also know from anthropological research and archaeological research that bisexuality was common in, let's say, ancient Greece and Rome. Um, we know from paintings on urns and from statues and writings and so on and so forth. But here is where I want to start to introduce a different concept and that is the concept of that culture shapes the way in which sex and gender diverse people will express themselves. So, for example, in Greece and Rome, bisexual behavior was common, at least among men, but it wasn't labeled bisexual behavior in either culture. In Greece, it, the, the, the significant factor was an older man with a younger boy mentoring that it was a mentoring relationship so but these men also had wives I'm sure some of these men that had 
relationships with younger boys and had wives were only attracted to boys, but probably lots of them were attracted to both. And in any case, early Greece, people didn't think that way about sexual orientation. It was appropriate for a man to have sex with a younger boy as long as he had a wife, um, and that was the kind of relationship that was sanctioned. The same was true, or a little bit different, in, in ancient Rome. In Rome, what was important, it wasn't important whether you, if you were a man, it wasn't important whether you had sex with a man, another man or a woman. What was important was the role that you played in sex. In other words, you had to be playing the penetrative role to be considered a legitimate man. Um, you had to be the inserter um, um, in anal sex, let's say, um, to be considered a man. That was what was acceptable, but the gender of the person that you were having sex with was unacceptable. Is that bisexuality? Yes, but it's but the ancient Romans didn't think of it that way, and it really is not very much like how we practice, you know, how gay people and bisexual behave today. Um, so, I want to, that leads me to the caveat I have about history, and I want to talk a little bit more about it. It's very, it's impossible to just retrofit our current concepts about sex and gender back onto history. You've seen when my talking about ancient Greece and ancient Rome that they were looking through a different lens than we are, and that's true in all cultures. And I, I want to give you an example of that. Um, that's not about bisexuality as much as it is about gender. Um, in the 1970s, the Lesbian Herstory Archives mounted a show called Passing Women, and it went all over the country, and um, my partner and I, Nancy and I, saw it when it went through. This was a show of photographs, old photographs, of women in the late 1800s and the um, first, early 20th century who spent their lives passing as men. They dressed as men, they assumed male names, male roles, and everyone thought that they were men. Frequently they weren't discovered until, um, uh, except by the mortician after death. Um, when we saw the show at the Lesbian Herstory Archives, those women were labeled lesbians, early lesbians, who were passing, who, whose, who were predominantly, their dominant As aspect of their sex and gender was that they were attracted to women and therefore had to pass as men. Well, we now know that that was probably true for some of those women, but some of those women actually identified as men. They were probably early trans women, not uh, or early trans men, um, as much as they were early lesbians. So, and 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 the bottom line is, unless unless they left us written uh, memoirs or letters or, um, you know, stuff of that nature, we don't really know how they felt inside. We don't know whether those women identified as male, um, identified as gay, passing it. We don't know how they identified, but it's, we can be sure it was different from the way we look at it today. So, it's the same as looking at people today. We can't tell by their identity what their behavior is, and we can't tell from their behavior what their attractions or their um, uh, um, uh, uh, self-identification is. Um, so just like we have no real way of knowing when Alexander the Great was having sex with men and women where he was coming from or how he regarded it, um, that's true when we look at his, all historical figures and, um, and it's important to keep that in mind. So, I want to return again to this principle that um, diverse sexual desires and behaviors diverse attractions, diverse gender presentations and self-perceptions have always existed both in non-human animals and in all human societies. So the, the diversity of sex and gender ha exists in all societies, in all humans, but the way that it gets manifest and expressed differs from culture to culture. Um, and it, it, it's 
so what the the nature part of sexuality is some kind of hardwiring. We're not really even sure what that hardwiring is. The nurture part is culture, not our parents. It's not our parents that make us um, identify as gay, for example, if we have same-sex attractions. It's a culture that has that label available, um, that has a subculture a culture available to support that definition. That's why we identify as gay if we have same-sex attractions. At the most basic, here's an example at the most basic level. One of the countries in the world, with, I think it has the second highest rate of gender reassignment surgery in the world, is Iran. Why, you ask, in a repressive Muslim society? Because being homosexual is a crime punishable by death, but having a sex change operation is paid for by the state. And so if you, I mean, it's a horrible sort of gruesome example, but if you are a man and you are attracted to other men, it's easier for you to get a sex change operation and be with your boyfriend than it is for you to be, to identify as gay. That's a reason for all those surgeries. Um, and that's a dramatic example of how culture um, defines not only whether sex and gender diversity will get expressed, but how it's going to be expressed what's allowed and acceptable in the culture. The Berdache, Hijra, uh, the Berdache of Native Americans, Hijra of India, our gay people, probably the same wiring, different definition, different lifestyle, um, um, and that's again what makes it so hard for us to define what bisexuals were in history. So let's switch to the current model because before the 1860s or so, the term bisexuality didn't even exist, so people could hardly think of themselves as bisexual. What happened in the 1850s was um, that the 1850s marked the first scientific attempt to actually study sexuality. And the first thing that those early scientists focused on was sexual deviance, all right? Uh, what we what we would now label as gender variance, um, sexual orient, same sex sexual orientation, and or BDSM. All right. So the early sexologists, Kraft Ebbing was the most well known, were concerned with um, what we now people that we now call gay, kinky, um, bisexual, or transgender. Um, so the modern concepts of homosexuality and bisexuality grew out of that attempt to label and categorize sexual deviance. And from the beginning, the field of sexology has always had a tension between two different models of um, sex and gender variation. On one hand, um, people, the founder, in fact, of the field of, of sexology is considered to be Kraft Ebbing, who had a pathology model of sexual deviance that that means you know the statistically normative behavior is also healthy and statistically unusual behavior is automatically unhealthy so Kraft Ebbing had that pathology perspective Havelock Ellis and later people like Magnus Hirschfeld and Kinsey had a more normal variation um, sexuality is like birds in nature, you know, lots of different plumage, lots of different songs, um, diversity is part of the natural order and there's nothing abnormal about it. So those two different models, pathology, normal, pathology, normal, have battled with each other throughout the history of sexology around the definitions of homosexuality and, and bisexuality and, and kink and, and transgenderism. Okay. Until the mid-20th century, as a matter of fact, um, sexuality and gender were sort of considered to be the same thing. They were conflated. Um, gay people, people who were oriented toward the same sex were called inverts, meaning the idea was that they were somehow psychological, um, if it was a man, psychologically feminine, um, and that's why they were attracted to men, because their 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 sex, their their sort of gender was inverted. Um, 
Havelock Ellis was the first person to define bisexuality, but he actually saw it as an intersex condition. Intersex people uh, are the people that the term used to be hermaphroditism, and now the term is intersex, are people who are born biologically with biologically mixed gender. Um, and Havelock Ellis initially in the late 1800s defined bisexuality as an intersex condition. The first time that the term bisexual was used to mean an attraction to both men and women was by a guy named Charles Gilbert Shattuck in 1892. He was translating Kraft Ebbing's um, Psychopathologia Sexualis and he used the term and that's and he came up with the term bisexual. Now in the 20th century and, and, and up to current history, Freud also saw bisexuality as tied to uh, masculine and feminine character traits. Um, and for a while, uh, the Freudian uh, theory of psychosexual development implied that everybody was bisexual for a time, and then you went through that bisexual period in normal development and became heterosexual. So um, Freud may be, have been the first person to say that everybody's born bisexual. But people still, there are people who still believe that, but, but Freud was the first person to say that. Our current definition um, which has to do with attraction, not physical characteristics or anatomy and not even psychological um, characteristics. That came about in the 1970s, um, probably because by then the cultural trope had become sexual orientation and gender are totally separate, have nothing to do with each other. That's never been totally true, but that's the, the current sort of party line, is that there's no intersection of sexual orientation and uh, gender identity. And so we define bisexuality purely now as having to do with sexual attraction to both, uh, to more than one gender. Okay, other important moments um, in the history of sexology that have to do with bisexuality. Kinsey's research in the 1940s because Kinsey shocked the US, shocked American people because the statistics he published showed that a large number of men and women had both same-sex and um, opposite-sex attractions and behavior. Um, and ultimately Kinsey was hounded um, out of, ultimately probably out of his life by people who were totally freaked out in the 1950s that that many Americans could have had same-sex attractions and behavior that they could have been bisexual. The other important thing that Kinsey gave us um, is the idea of the Kinsey continuum. Uh, he was the first person to say there aren't two categories, gay and straight, there aren't even three categories, gay, straight, and bi. What there is is there's a continuum. On one hand, people who are exclusively heterosexual in their attractions. On the other hand, people who are exclusively homosexual or same-sex oriented in their attraction and everybody in between at varying points. Um, uh, unfortunately, the idea of the Kinsey continuum never really took hold in the way that Kinsey intended it to be. And so it seemed to devolve into three categories, gay, straight, or bisexual, and most people came to believe that bisexual meant equal attractions to both men and women. Okay, the next person to come along that um, after Kinsey that is important to research on bisexuality and our concept of bisexuality is Fritz, Fritz Klein, who was undoubtedly the most important bisexual of the 20th century. Um, he was a psychologist and in the 1970s Fritz Klein published a book called The Bisexual Option in 1978. Pretty early for that to be out there. Um, and he created what is called the Klein Sexual Orientation Grid, which is a multi-dimensional grid in which people measure themselves on a bunch of different continuums, not just attraction, but 
um, you know, so, so what Klein said is, yes, Kinsey was right, but he didn't go far enough, right? Because people vary not just in their attractions, but they attract, uh, vary in their, their, their behavior, their romantic attractions, um, their social preferences. He coined the term homosocial, right? For people who want to be with, socialize with people of the same sex, not necessarily attracted to them. Um, so that was Klein. And the other thing, he did two other very important things. He founded, in 1999, he founded the Journal of Bisexuality, which is the very first academic journal um, that took bisexuality seriously. And he created the American, he was apparently quite wealthy, and when he died, um, he left all of his money to an organization he created called the American Institute for Bisexuality, which funds research um, on bisexuality and um, and related topics. But the 1970s, in some ways, were the high point of interest in and research in um, bisexuality, not only Fritz Klein, but um, Pepper Schwartz and Philip Blumstein. And those people really thought that um, that it would become sort of the hot topic of the last part of the 20, 20th century. That never happened. Um, what happened really was in the 1980s, the study of bisexuality became entirely confined to uh, men having sex with both men and women in the midst of the AIDS epidemic and a lot of the research kind of fell to the wayside. Um, there was some organizing. Um, uh, in, in 19, the, a declaration of support for bisexuals had come from sort of lefty groups as early as the 70s. In 1972, the Quakers published a, something, a position paper called the Ithaca Statement uh, in which they supported bisexuals. So the sort of advocacy support part was there, um, but not much had been organized. In the 1980s, bisexual groups began to organize. Often, and this is sort of interesting, the groups were started by women who had formally identified as lesbians and then realized that they were bisexual and didn't want to leave the queer community and so began to organize groups. I can remember in 1989 going to a conference in Boston organized by a group of women that called themselves the Hasbians, um, formerly lesbian, now bisexual. Um, and it looked for a while as though, you know, that that movement might really grow, but I think the thing that stymied it was the AIDS epidemic and um, the fear that bisexual people were going to spread AIDS both into the lesbian community and to the heterosexual community really delayed acceptance of bisexuality. Um, nevertheless, by 1990, um, Binet USA had formed, that's the first national network group of bisexual people, and in 1993, the March on Washington for lesbian and gay equal rights became for the first time the March on Washington for lesbian, uh, gay, and bisexual equal rights and liberation. So the B finally got added to the L and the G in the early 90s. All right. The 20th, what's gone on in the 21st century? Um, to an extent, bisexuality has become more um, visible in the gay community. That's what the San Francisco Human Rights Committee found. Not visible enough, but more visible than before. Um, biphobia has become actual a focus of research in and on its own. That's where that study uh, by Herrick et al. came from. Um, uh, when I when I quoted the statistics before about bisexuals being the only group being less accepted than bisexuals were injecting drug users, that was um, research that really came about in the early um, early 21st century because bisexual bisexual biphobia became a legitimate 
focus of research. And some of the academic discourse about that has actually been pretty interesting. Bisexual people are, um, you know, in queer theory, often compared to biracial people. Because just like biracial people, they're the people that sort of, they're boundary violators. They're people that have crossed over the line for both groups. Right and 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 often wind up being stigmatized by both groups of which they could be a member. Um, in the couple of other things notable have happened. In fact, a number of things notable have happened in research that may may not be labeled research on bisexuality, but indirectly it is. Some of it is re labeled. The first thing that happened is early in in the 21st century, a woman named Meredith Chivers. Um, did a groundbreaking study in which she hooked men and women of all sexual identities and sexual orientations up to um, the, the equipment that measured the physiological indicators of arousal and she showed them erotic pictures, um, pornography. Um, and what she found, and then she asked them for self-reports, um, what she found was that no matter what people self-reported, women were aroused by almost anything. Same sex, opposite sex, um, three people, group sex, animals. Women were turned on by pretty much everything and men were category specific. That is the men that um, declared their identity to be gay were pretty much only attracted to gay porn and the women uh, that identified, uh, I'm sorry, the men that identified themselves as straight were pretty much only attracted to heterosexual porn. That study led many people to conclude that bisexuality doesn't exist among men and um, J. Michael Bailey at the time, one of the more famous sex researchers at the time, proclaimed very, did his own research uh, in which he recruited self-identified bisexual men, hooked them up to the same equipment, and he decided that, he, that th and found that the men that he had recruited were more attracted to men than uh, to women, even though they identified as bisexuals. And so Bailey said, there really is no such thing as a bisexual man. It may exist among women, um, but doesn't exist among men. And men who claim to be bisexual are really gay, reinforcing every stereotype that everybody had of bisexuals. Well, here's the story. First off, um, there are, we now know that the equipment, we're now using a different indicator of sexual arousal in, in, in these research studies, and that is um, pupil dilation. Because what we found is that um, the previous measures, like they would measure the extent to which a man's penis became erect, the extent to which a woman uh, lubricated, um, her vagina lubricated. Well, penile erection is easily blocked by anxiety, and it's also can be consciously blocked, right? If somebody doesn't want to be aroused to something, they're not going to be aroused to something. If a man doesn't want to get an erection, doesn't want to find something arousing, he can, many men can sort of damp down uh, the erection response, but not pupil dilation. So if you do the same research with pupil dilation as a measure instead of um, penile erection, men are bisexual too. If you do Bailey's study and you recruit differently, um, you recruit from bisexual political organizations, for example, bisexuality exists in men just as it does in women. But that was one of the big controversies of the first decade or so of the 21st century was, uh, in fact, as recently as March of 2014, the New York Times Magazine had a cover story called The Scientific Quest to Prove Bisexuality Exists. So as recently as, March, as 2014, people were still questioning the, um, the uh, existence of bisexuality. Second big bunch of research that's been important in the 21st century is research that's actually funded by the American Institute of Bisexuality. And that includes Lisa Diamond's research, who we will talk about, has been mentioned in um, the, the uh, overall introduction to this course. 
and we'll talk a lot more about her work um, uh, going forward. Lisa Diamond is the woman who studied um, sexual fluidity in women and found women changing their sexual identities and self-labels several times over a period of 15 years. Well, at first Lisa Diamond believed that, like everybody else, that this sort of sexual fluidity was only um, uh, common in women as well, that it didn't exist in men, but she's changed her mind and in February of 2014 she presented a paper called um, I Was Wrong, Men Are Pretty Darn Fluid Too. So we're finding that both men and women, there are some men and women who are not just bisexual but change their sexual orientation over time, not voluntarily, it, we don't know how it happens. Um, another really important area of research is stuff done, that's being done by Rich Savin Williams. Um, and what Rich Savin Williams, he started studying what he called mostly heterosexual men. And now what he's doing is, is research that really does confirm the Kinsey continuum. That if you give people, particularly younger people, options of more ways to label themselves, some people will label themselves exclusively heterosexual, but many will label themselves mostly heterosexual, heterosexual with, you know, with a significant attraction to same-sex people. If you give, he, I think in his research he's now giving people eight or nine choices based on the Kinsey continuum and finding that people will self-identify all along that continuum if you give them the options. So it's the breakdown of the three category system of uh, uh, describing sexual orientation. The Kinsey continuum really is being affirmed by some of the, um, the, the, the new research. And we're also looking at research on sort of beyond bisexuality. What do you, what sexual orientation, for example, is um, a female to male transgender person who is only attracted to other female to male transgender people. Um, in fact, if you think about it, what sexual orientation is, is it if somebody is attracted to transgender people, especially trans men, <coughs> excuse me, who, do, who frequently do not have bottom surgery, and so you're really dealing with people with a mix of um, genitalia. So what sexual orientation is that? Same sex, opposite sex, or something else entirely? That's sort of the wave of the future. So I'm going to take just a couple of minutes now and wrap up what we've talked about in this introduction to bisexuality um, and talk a little bit about what bisexual people have to teach us. So some important concepts for you to take away from this. The concepts of biphobia, bi-invisibility, and bi-erasure, um, because those are important problems in the um, LGBT community. The idea that bisexuals experience a particular type of, of what we call minority stress, and it's a particular type of minority stress because it is coming from a doubly stigmatized status. Um, in fact, there is research that shows that uh, bisexuals have worse mental health problems than either gays or lesbians, um, probably as a result of this particular kind of minority stress. And it's important for us to take a look at the sources of biphobia because they're different depending on who's the person who's phobic. The numbers about bisexuality. Most current surveys show that bisexually identified people slightly outnumber gays or, or lesbians and because we know that bisexuals come out so much less frequently, um, we can assume that, the, that, the, that those numbers are even higher, that that's an underrepresentation of bisexual people. While we also know that while bisexuality and sexual fluidity at first, we thought that those things were more common among women than men. Now it's beginning to look as though um, there are equal numbers of sexually fluid and bisexual people among males and females. 
And there is, and this is maybe the most important of this statistical stuff for you to remember, there's a large, a huge cohort effect. A 40-year-old who identifies as bisexual probably doesn't mean the same thing as a 20-year-old who identifies as bisexual. Certainly a 60-year-old who identifies as bisexual means something totally different. So the younger people are, the meaning of the term use changes, how they're applying it to themselves, um, but also more people are coming out not just as bisexual but as um, descriptors of sexual orientation that, that some of us never even dreamed of. Um, okay. Um, what's important conceptually here? First thing that's important conceptually is to understand that bisexuality is kind of a catch-all residual category and it includes under, it's, it's, a, it's a big tent concept, it's a big tent concept and under that tent live many different kinds of people who have their own unique definition of what bisexuality means. So it's a much more heterogeneous group than a group of self-identified gay people or lesbian people. Um, we need to remember conceptually that there are huge differences between attractions, behavior, and identity. Um, and, and, and we can't confuse one for the other. We can't assume that someone who identifies bisexually, we can't assume much about them. Um, we can't assume, in terms of who they're attracted to, we can't even assume that someone who identifies as gay or lesbian, um, that, 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 that's, that's, that they're only attracted to same-sex people. So identity is maybe the least reliable way of describing someone. Um, but in a culture like ours, with the extent of biphobia, we are going to find more people with attraction who have attractions than who act on it, more people who act on it than who self-identify, more people who self-identify than the, the number of those who come out. Um, so what are we going to talk about in future talks? Um, it may be difficult for you to imagine four more hours on bisexuality. So I'm going to give you an idea, but it isn't because this is because bisexuality is such a huge tent. Um, it also gives us a lot to talk about and as I said, a lot we can learn. Um, so in future uh, talks, we're going to explore what the actual lives of bisexual people are like, what kind of difficulties they face. Um, we're going to look very much at the intersection of polyamorous people, kinky people, transgender people, and bisexual people because there's a huge overlap in those communities. We're, and we're going to talk about the prevalence of um, uh, in, in, among people who identify as bisexual, there are more transgender people than you would expect, more kinky people than you would expect by chance, more people who have open relationships or polyamorous. So we'll, we'll go a lot into that. We're going to talk a great deal about the clinical issues. What actually happens when somebody comes to your office and they're bisexual? Why do they usually come? What do they need help with? What kind of attitudes uh, do you need to express to show support and advocacy? What kind of interventions will be effective? And we're going to talk about more theoretical issues like the relationship between bisexuality and gender, the relationship between sexual attraction and romantic attraction. We're going to talk about sexual fluidity and change. And we're going to talk about how the intersectionality that I mentioned before, how it's producing new identities and new ways of being um, and what the future direction of the queer community is going to be. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed or got something out of this lecture.